Okay, it's live. So hi everyone, I am Molly Jane from CoinMarketCap and I'm coming at you today on Thursday with our next edition of CoinMarketCap Cha Cha Chats. With us today, we have Bruce Fenton from Satoshi Roundtable and we also have Isaiah Jackson who's the author of Bitcoin and Black America. So everyone that's watching right now, join us with a cup of tea as we drink some tea or some chai and talk about some on-chain activity. If you guys want, you can introduce yourselves a little bit more than that. Hey, I'm Bruce Fenton. Thanks for joining us. And I'm really psyched to have Isaiah with us. Uh, we first met quite a while ago, and then we met um, most recently it was maybe a few months before the, the the 2020 madness out in Chicago at that really cool event. And I really liked your speech. So I was one of the lucky ones who got to read your book uh, before your latest round, which it seems like it's quite popular lately. So thanks for joining. It's super great to see you. Oh yeah, great to be here. And yeah, um, we uh, I got to see Bruce in Chicago this time last year. So uh, yeah, good to see you again. Good to see you as well, Molly. Uh, my name is Isaiah Jackson, like I stated before, author of Bitcoin and Black America. I've uh, been in the space since 2013, um, seen it grow a lot and um, you know, just ready to, to speak about some of the things that were discussed in the book as well as uh, some of the things that have happened since then. So uh, that is, uh, you know, why I'm here today and glad to be here. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know, this is the book. It's uh, called uh, Bitcoin and Black America by Isaiah Jackson. I think it's great. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun read. Very. Have you done an audio book of this, by the way? I have not, but there will be one for the second version. Because it would work great as an audio book. It's just got a nice flow. It just feels very conversational. I like it. And it covers sort of everything from, you know, what is Bitcoin to the background, how it works to, I mean, you know, pretty much anything. And, and then, the, you know, the bulk of the topic is the title. So that, that would be a great thing to, to, uh, for, to have you discuss, like, uh, you know, what, what, what is Black America and Bitcoin? And uh, what is your sort of uh, view on, on, on how uh, Bitcoin can help Black America? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, in, in my studies of uh, Bitcoin, which has been the last seven years, going on eight, um, you know, and I've been Black my whole life, uh, I could tell there was a synergy between the two. And what I mean when I say Black America or Black economics is just uh, my community being able to work together to achieve sort of the group economics we've seen in other groups. Um, and financially, it always works, uh, being able to help those who are local to you. And for the most part, uh, most of the people in my community live around other black people. And when it comes to money, um, the root of most of the problems we see today for everybody is based on money. And I think Bitcoin can help solve some of those problems, uh, if not all, depending on uh, you know how it's you know perceived by everybody. And the book itself is, uh, in my opinion, a great guide for anybody. Uh, about 80% of the stuff, you just substitute Black America with whatever group, religious, social, uh, racial that you want to be a part of, it will work for you too. Uh, but there are some sp specific things in our community that I think uh, should be addressed. Um, and in regards to Bitcoin, I think uh, because we're one of the least represented, uh, that is why I wanted to make sure I wrote this book for my community and so that they can view it. So. Um, that is the premise of the book. And of course, uh, like Bruce said before, it is sort of fun. I didn't want to make it too, because when you get into Bitcoin, it can get really techy, it can get really confusing really quick. So I wanted to make it plain language so that, you know, people could actually understand the concepts, make it as simple as possible, and then uh, come up with solutions. I'm a solution-based person. So that was the premise of the book. And uh, I can jump into my chart here, um, if that's possible. Let's Perfect. See. Let me share the screen here. Um, yeah, we have a chart each episode. So uh, Isaiah is going to pull up a chart talk or a, uh, a chart to talk a little bit about some of these points. Oh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to bring up this chart. Um, it's not a Bitcoin chart. It's not a crypto chart, blockchain chart. This is uh, a chart that was created in 2013 based on the study. Um, and it came about in The Guardian. Uh, it was a story in 2017 that basically said the median wealth of Black Americans will be $0 by 2053, 2053. So uh, if you think about like right now, um, you know, that's 33 years. That's not a long time. That, I mean, we'll probably still be here for that time period. And the reason I wanted to show this median household wealth is to show not only in 2013, that was the median wealth, but if you notice, the median wealth has not changed much since 83. Um, 20 years of the same median wealth, nothing has worked. 
um, in, as far as increasing wealth in our community. Um, and one of the reasons for that, of course, I think the number one reason inflation um, that keeps everybody's money down. But in the black community, one of the biggest things, of course, was the uh, redlining uh, because real estate is the number one uh, way to build wealth. Uh, also, uh, the GI Bill that was kept out, uh, black people were kept away from getting the GI Bill following World War II, which gave people a lot of capital for uh, real estate. Uh, to progress. And of course, um, going into today, uh, just regular, you know, money problems that we see with uh, payday loan sharks, with uh, the, the bankers denying loans in the book, I have examples starting in 2012. So it's not some ancient, uh, you know, practice uh, starting in 2012 up to now have examples in the book showing exactly how banks can uh, racially discriminate. And uh, very slick ways, not very overt, very slick ways that they can. And this chart to me means a lot because there's no improvement. So as much as people talk about, you can get in the gold, you can get in the silver, real estate, stocks, you know, whatever you want to try and get people in the black community into to try and increase wealth, it hasn't worked. And honestly, the only system I see where we have a shot is something like Bitcoin, where you're paid off of your merit. It's, in my opinion, the best money system because it's scarce. And the money that you're able to make in that system is purely based off of your, your merit based off of the work that you do. And of course, long-term as a store of value, uh, there has been nothing that has performed better than Bitcoin the last decade and no asset that's performed better than Bitcoin this year. So uh, not only do I think in the black community, Bitcoin should be stored for value um, as, a, as an economy going forward, if we're gonna accept Bitcoin as money, the next step is medium of exchange. And then following that is a unit of account. So if that's going to happen, first things first, we have to, of course, get uh, or accumulate Bitcoin. Um, that can happen a few different ways. You can earn it. Of course, you can uh, mine it. Uh, pretty tough for individuals, but um, you can also accept it for payment uh, for your business. There's a lot of different ways. And I think closing that wealth gap is going to take more than what we've experienced before. And just in my personal life, uh, the wealth gap between me and some of my peers closed exponentially and I've surpassed a lot of them by using Bitcoin as a store of value the last seven years. So um, it's not a competition per se, but as far as life and being able to live, you know, as freely as you want to, the basis of that is money. And I think when you have a, a open money system like Bitcoin, this chart will not exist by 2053. And that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I have brought this chart, this chart up today, because it may be alarming to some, uh, but uh, the average savings uh, in the black community is still less than a thousand dollars, according to other reports. So, as far as the store value, um, I think Bitcoin works perfect, and I think going into the future, we will need Bitcoin as a solution to sort of close that wealth gap and to uh, increase uh, our chance at generational wealth. That's great. What do you see as the way for people to, you know, when you have people, you know, if if the average savings is only a thousand bucks. Can you talk a little bit about like some of the ways to, to earn earn money in Bitcoin? One of the things I thought was really a, a amazing stat in your book was that I think you said money leaves the black community in six hours on six average. Hours. Can you on talk average. a little bit about that and how how somebody who only has 500 or 1,000 bucks, maybe they can participate by, you know, using it in their business or, or, or job or something? Absolutely. So uh, when I made that reference, uh, group economics is practiced by different, uh, different racial groups uh, in the uh, the Chinese community, Japanese community. I live in LA. I've seen Chinatown. I've seen Koreatown, Little Ethiopia. Uh, all of these, you know, uh, small communities where in group economics, the first money that they get, they spend it with the people in that group. And because it's a circular economy, everybody benefits. You eat at the, the local place. You wash your clothes at a, at a local place. Uh, in the Black community, unfortunately, uh, without ownership, as soon as you get the money, first thing you do is you pay somebody from the outside community for uh, bills, you pay somebody from the outside community for clothes, there's nobody, no real ownership. And one of the things that prevents that uh, cash wise is you're always spending because your dollar's worth less tomorrow. So it encourages spending, whereas Bitcoin encourages store value as well as business owners when they accept it um, over time, um, you can start a circular economy that's outside of what we have now. If you're a business that was such Bitcoin, and then your manufacturer starts accepting Bitcoin and then your customers start paying in Bitcoin, you can almost at a certain point move totally away from fiat. Um, and in my opinion, 
that won't happen overnight. But if it is something that people want to do, we've seen communities start that in Brazil. We've seen in Venezuela. We've seen in different parts of the world where that is possible. And I think the circulation of the black dollar, so to say, can happen in a stable, scarce uh, economy like Bitcoin. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a really cool point, like keeping money. And, and like you said at the beginning, it, this applies to any community. It could be just your localization community in yeah. whatever, your town or your community. And uh, I think there's something to be said for for like, whether you call them Kiretsus or mafias or whatever, you know, these groups. And there's been a lot of it uh, in with among super wealthy people in Silicon Valley and stuff where they just work with each other. And like oh, yeah. you mentioned in your book, you know, you go into Koreatown, they hire each other and they spend the money right in their own local community. And, and that's something that you can learn, you know, not just the black community, but any community can, can benefit from. Oh yeah. Yeah. And working with uh, venture capitalists the last year, um, you can see their circulation of money is literally, you find family members, cousins, friends of friends. If you look it up, there'll be college roommates. There'll be old buddies from high school. They're literally just circulating in amongst, and they call it the good old boys club. But that is what a circular economy is. If you're circulating that money, nobody's ever really broke or poor or lacking. Because right. if you have any type of skill, which in the black community, I believe a lot of people do, the money's coming. And as soon as you get it, it the mindset is as soon as I make my millions, pass it on and give it on to somebody else. So that mindset, I think, can be prevalent in our community. You just have to work at it. That's great. So I'm jumping in here. I have a question from someone on Twitter that asked earlier for you. This is at Unstable Coins. Here she wrote, so do we know if Bitcoin is equally represented across all American ethnicities? The ones that I know that own a lot, that own the most are all white. The Winkleboss twins, Silbert, et cetera. Who are the black whales and should there be more of them? Oh yeah, so um, as far as black whales, um, usually whales stay in secret. Um, so you won't really ever find them no matter race anyway. Uh, but just for the retail investors, um, right now, from a number standpoint, I will say it is mostly uh, white male, 30, 40 years old. However, with the international scope of Bitcoin, meaning anybody can use it, those numbers really can't be counted right now. Because you have, in my opinion, millions of people right now on the African continent using Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as we speak, but they're not in the news as far as, yeah, this number of people use it or in Black America, how many Black people? I mean, it's plenty of Black people I know that use Bitcoin and crypto, but they're not in the news. They're not getting, you know, that sort of uh, media push. So you won't really see it um, until you go outside. So what I mean by that is conferences, meetups, things of that nature. When I first started, I was the only Black person at every meetup from like 2013, 2016. That's changed a lot since, two, since, since that time period because in 2017, the bull run happened. A lot of people got introduced to it. A lot of people became bag holders uh, <laughs> from behind the top. Uh, so we do have in the black community, a lot of people that know about it and have maybe used a small amount, but that representation uh, I believe will broaden as everybody finds out about it. You can't know about what you don't know. Um, so as that increases, I think I'm doing my part and I think uh, others will catch on uh, the same. That's cool. You mentioned in your book, um, I think you said, I think you said it was the, the, there was a time period, I believe it was the thirties where there was a, a large number of black businesses that kept the money within their own community because it was, uh, there was actually laws preventing them from being in the regular economy. Right. And it was actually a good, I, I mean, the, the, there was a good period for, for black business growth. Uh, right. And you, you mentioned a really cool point. You said you, you guarantee they would be using Bitcoin if that was the case now, because they were, I mean, like, really, really uh, totally economically oppressed in a way different than, than what we have now. I mean, it was it was more like they were drug dealers or something. I mean, yeah. it was basically they, they literally couldn't participate in the economy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and when you said that, I said, yeah, absolutely. Of course they would be using Bitcoin. I mean, that's really powerful, <laughs> I think. Oh yeah, yeah. The separation of money uh, is very powerful. And, you know, some people didn't realize it, but in the late 1800s, we've already seen a crypto-like separation of money. It was just, you know, greenbacks, versus uh, other sorts of money around the country. So there were, before the Federal Reserve, there were different types of money and it was given value by the people that use it. And if you are wondering about those communities, I was talking about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, uh, in Wilmington, uh, in Florida, all around the country. But it wasn't as if, you know, back then, Black people created their own community just because they wanted to. They, like you said, they literally could not shop at white-owned businesses. So they created their own, they flourished, and because they had to use the same money system, it took away from that community, um, which 
caused the jealousy, which is why I got burned to the ground. Quite literally, thousands of people were murdered because they were economically viable. The good thing about today is uh, you can't burn down the internet. So digitally with Bitcoin, you can do the same thing, uh, create an economy that is booming, um, where of course it can be black owned, but anybody can shop with you. Uh, and with Bitcoin, nobody can actually stop it. So we have the vision already set and we're standing on their shoulders uh, for something going forward. Neat. I have another question from the audience and I'll just repeat again, if anyone wants to ask any questions that's watching, you can tag us on Twitter. You can go on to coinmarketcap.com slash chat, find us on YouTube. Um, but for now we have a message from Bitcoin bag holder who asks Isaiah, Bitcoin is associated with libertarian politics. Do you think the upcoming elections will have any impact on Bitcoin adoption in America and among black Americans? Um, I hope it has, I hope it, pushes people to get Bitcoin, uh, not just because of the election, because I'm gonna be honest with you, at, at my age, I have not had, I have not experienced a president that has changed the course of my life. Uh, most of what changes in your life is local and state politics. So as far as the president election, I don't think that will be a catalyst, so to say, uh, for Bitcoin. I will say when my book was released last year, July 11th, that was the one and only time that President Trump has tweeted about uh, Bitcoin. and. He, kind of trashed it, said he didn't like it. That was is literally July 11, 2019, the day my book was released. So uh, I don't, and that actually helped me. So I don't know if, if the election this year will do the same thing, but it will be interesting to see uh, two, you know, two presidential uh, candidates going at it. And then when people start realizing, man, our country may not be as stable or maybe I love the candidates and it is stable. Either way, I think if Bitcoin is brought up in a situation, uh, it will win simply because people are looking for some sort of backup option um, due to the Federal Reserve. So I don't think politics will, will, you know, mess with it that much, but may have a little bit of impact. We'll see. I have another question for myself. I, I remember covering earlier this year when there were the start of the Black Lives Matter protests in America, there were some opportunities to tokenize that. There was a George Flo Floyd token, et cetera. Do you think those things are are good for the community? The fact that people that want to raise money in different ways can then tokenize these events, or do you think that it's kind of um, making something into something economic when it should be a little bit more sacred than that? If that makes sense. Um, so some of those tokens, the, the only thing I, I hate about those is you don't know people's intention, um, and unfortunately, a lot of the tokens are controlled by central parties. So they could have good intentions, they could not. Uh, even if people with raising money uh, the regular way, they could have bad intentions, so you don't really know. Um, I think when people take the George Floyd uh, aspect, um, what they see is racial injustice. But if you look beneath the surface, him using a counterfeit $20 bill or being accused of it, as well as just the racial um, discrepancy and economics that, with the chart that I showed you before, the desperation that comes with that, that's how you come with these situations. You have situations where people who may be desperate, they do certain things, or they're in communities where they're automatically tagged as you know either a criminal or somebody doing something wrong because economically, if you are not economically supporting your city with taxes as much as other communities, police do not care about you as much. That's across the board. So uh, that's a symptom of what we had. And I think if you get to the very root of it, um, I think at that root, that's why you saw the tokenization of maybe a, a token to raise coins. But I think at the root of it, uh, if the Federal Reserve was not on was not suppressing the black community on purpose, uh, you wouldn't have these communities where they're viewed as you know as thugs, criminals, animals, just off the bat without you know realizing it. And money doesn't solve everything, but you can keep a lot of the uh, the trash out um, with uh, your community if you can support yourself. So I think that is important. And I, I don't know. If people were trying to take advantage of it, I don't know for sure, but I do know at some of the protests, some people were holding signs with Bitcoin in Black America, uh, read Bitcoin in Black America, because when the smoke clears, there needs to be an economic solution. Uh, we were doing this in 2014 with Mike Brown or 2016 uh, and with Trayvon Martin. It's the same stuff. March, complain, go home, and then nothing happens. It's like, all right, well, what do we do from here? So I think uh, tokenization, crypto, Bitcoin, anything that can move away from the system will help. Interesting yeah, response. Um, I have another question from our chat uh, user 39770047. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Asked, <laughs> do we have any black blockchain developers? Yes, uh, plenty. Um, there are a few. 
that are in the um, there. Uh, let's see, the, in the directory in the back of that book, uh, like I stated before, I have a, the second edition coming. Uh, that directory actually has almost 200 professionals, uh, probably about 40 are black blockchain developers per se. Um, and, you know, just in, just in the industry, like I said, you probably won't find them online. A lot of developers like to stay anonymous or keep their, their you know, their secrecy, but you got to go outside. If you go to any meetups, if you go to uh, conferences, of course, right now with coronavirus, that's kind of hard. But just in my experience, you meet a lot of people who are involved in the space. So, yes, a lot of black blockchain developers and Bitcoin developers. That's great. I had a question. Uh... Have, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is capital uh, f- formation, you know, creation of new businesses. There's a lot of cool trends with this between like increasing the crowdfunding limits, securities tokens, there's some new exchanges, new ways of doing things. And now that you've got rolling funds, so you've got potentially more founders and more, and, and there's been a huge push, especially in the last six months about, uh, you know, VCs and others who are trying to invest in black founders or better yet, invest in black investors. And uh, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, that somebody just tweeted yesterday. It was kind of funny because there was a lot of people who were critical of this tweet. Um, but they said something like, if you invest in enough black founders that, that can erase the, that, that, that'll, that'll level the 400 years of uneven playing field because the theory is that you invest in black founders, then they invest in other founders. And they got a lot of, uh, a lot of people gave them a hard time in that. They're like, well, it's not that simple. But I thought the, the tweet was, uh, or, the, or the person who said it, I think they probably meant well. But anyway, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Oh yeah, so when it comes to, uh, to investment, uh, especially in the black community, uh, one of the things I've always pushed was merit, um, being able to, to earn the investment based on your merit. The problem is a lot of investors don't even look at black, black businesses or don't even look at black uh, CEOs, or as I've heard personally from people that they don't trust black owners with money, that they don't think that they can manage it, that they don't think they can use it correctly. Um, so just sort of shifting the look to a more of a broad view and not investing in the same people, you will find black owned companies that are worth it, that you can invest in, that are great uh, for investment. And it's not charity. Nobody is asking you to just go and give us money, um, you know, just because, or just because I'm black. Uh, life's been hard. Give me a thousand dollars. That's or a million dollars. That's no. That's that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is the industry is so is so large, so broad um, that if for some reason you're looking, quote unquote, at the entire industry to invest in, and you still end up with ninety eight percent white male founders, you're not really looking at hard. I mean, it's it's just it, it, that's impossible with the, the way the market is. So I think these investments uh, are good it's from a money standpoint. People can get the money that they weren't able before. I do think some of it is virtue signaling. Some of these companies do not give a damn about black people. They really just want to look good in our eyes. So, um, you know, that's sort of the balancing act of being black. You have to be able to, to see it or notice it. Um, some people just say, I don't care. They can virtue signal all they want. Just give me the money. Uh, I'd rather have that. <laughs> and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss it from there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a mix up. It's a very nuanced argument. So there's no one way to go about it. But as somebody who is starting a, a new company, one of the things I've always preached was that I feel like I have the merit and the, the the work behind it to attain investment, but it's been even hard for me, even with a popular book or with you know my track record of, of, of uh, businesses being successful. So it's just, it is what it is. Uh, you just have to fight through that. And I, I'm glad that people are starting to notice that black owned uh, founders are just as relevant as any other. I wanted just to give a shout out. We have over 150 live viewers right now, which is a lot more than normal. So people are interested. (laughs) What you're saying. Shout out to everybody out there. Thank you for watching. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this is Uh, great stuff. Yeah, I I really like what you say about merit. Um, You know, race is such a tough topic now. It's, it's, I, I think that, that there's a lot of people who I think agree on the problems, but when you get into discussing solutions, it can get very contentious. And, and a lot of yeah. people assume like, oh, he disagrees with the solution, therefore he must be racist or something like that. <laughs> and I think one thing I really like about your book is it, you, you talk about merit and also you, you specifically note that, you know, black people are not monolithic, you know? And yeah. I think that's part of the problem. When you talked about like predatory lending and stuff like that, there's a lot of people who, like you say, virtual signal, they they appear to mean well because they're marketing, but they just view black people as either the black vote or the black 
you know, consumers. Like these are the people who are gonna buy our sneakers or these are the people who are gonna buy, uh, you know, our politician and they don't really care either way. And so because you have this huge marketing effort on that, that makes it very, very difficult. And I think um, your, your book is one of the things that I think talks about, it doesn't so much even talk about race, but talks about these problems in a, in a pretty productive way that I think, uh, you know, so congratulations on that. I, mean, I think it's a hard, hard topic, and, and a lot of thing, a lot of, a lot of things maybe either mean well and aren't productive, or just aren't productive at all. But yours is, yeah. yours is really good. I think those were a couple yeah. points that that were helpful in it. Yeah, and I think when you when you talk about virtue signaling uh, with some of these just you know companies or whatnot, I do want to throw in there. I did read about uh, Wells Fargo. Uh, they have like a commercial going on now where they supposedly fed 50 million people uh, with you know, turning their uh, their branches into food drives. And then when you dig deeper, the for every $1, that's what they spend on food for each person. So $1 worth of food, how much is that really? And then also it's sort of like the uh, Nino Brown effect. If you've ever seen New, New Jack City, he sold crack and killed millions of uh, thousands of people, but he gave away turkeys on Thanksgiving. That's what Wells Fargo is doing. It's like, oh yeah, we, yeah, we caused billions of dollars worth of damage, but here's $50 million worth of food. Thanks a lot, Wells Fargo. It's just... It's just the virtue signaling is disgusting to me because I know some of these, I mean, Starbucks did a, a total turnaround at first. It was like, well, no, you can't wear Black Lives Matter stuff. Well, now you can. Okay. And then it's just like, okay, at this point, just be straight up. Um, if you care about things based on metrics and your metrics always seem to exclude people of color, you might need to change the metrics. That's what people use as, as the excuse. It was like, well, this is what we go by. And I was like, yeah, that that is usually rooted in racial discrimination and then it manifests in uh, social or economic uh, uh, discrimination because um, you know that's that's just one of the examples but yeah I, I just want to chime in there because people got have to be vigilant especially in my community everybody's not your friend everybody's not trying to see your best interest at heart and the money that you receive or investments that you receive uh, can't always be pure but like I said Bitcoin to me is a solution where nobody can control you nobody can stop you from getting it nobody can stop you from earning it and nobody is unconfiscatable, so nobody can take it from you. So um, that's that's sort of the value proposition I want to make sure we push out there. For sure. And not only not only do you not know if somebody has your best interest at heart, they may have your best interest at heart, but they might be wrong. They I mean, there's politicians yeah. all the time. They think they're helping black people. I think there's a lot of, I don't want to get too much into the politics of it, but I think there's a lot of politicians who kind of market themselves as helping black people, but they're the same ones who are locking the black people up in, 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 in mm -hmm. huge, you know, we have more people in prison than the Soviets had in Gulag. So there's a lot of people who, you know, sort of say they mean well, but they might just make goofy bad policies that end <laughs> up, you know, inadvertently oppressing people, you know? Oh yeah, it, it goes back to black people not being monolithic. Yeah, politicians, right. sometimes uh, the advisors for some of these businesses, what they end up doing is they ask their three or four black people that are around and it's like, how did you get a gauge of the black community from those three people or from those two people? And then they go forward and then everybody else is like, what is this? This has nothing to do with helping black people at all and uh, just kind of get ignored. So it is what it is, but I'm all about helping yourself, being self-sufficient. Um, asking is not really big. I'd rather ask for forgiveness than for permission. I'm not really big on asking asking people for anything. And I think Bitcoin is a way to take what you're owed anyway. Uh, so if you own an asset that all of the rich people don't own yet, and you are trying to say that this money should be in our, uh, in our community, when they do start to buy this asset because it is scarce, the money will come back to you anyway. So you don't have to fight for reparations for years. You don't have to go to Congress and ask them, please make a reservation so that, you know, every board has one person of color one black all that will figure itself out when the money's fixed uh all the other stuff is only based on the fact that the money's controlled so they can make the rules around it so once that's gone we'll we'll see uh exactly how everything works awesome i have one more point again this is moving a little bit away from cryptocurrency as financial freedom and just money as financial freedom but again during the beginning of the black lives matter protest i know there was this sort of trending thing on Twitter where white people would send black friends and acquaintances $10 on Venmo and say, I know you've been having a bad time, go get a cup of coffee. And I, I read about it, I listened you know, to some podcasts about it and most of the black people that were interviewed said that it felt really strange that um, people would assume that they couldn't financially support themselves and that they would appreciate this as a, as a gesture. So I'm just wondering if you think 
I don't know. I'm getting really off topic. <laughs> you have any opinions about that? Yeah, I, I, I see where you're going. But uh, oh, good. Well, let me just start off by saying, please don't send me any money, any pity money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you. Oh man, it's in 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 this in this media manufactured because. Um, you know, black people have had these problems our entire life. And then just one spark of the media with something going on, all of a sudden it's, oh my God, I can't believe you're still going through this in 2020. It's like, I've learned to live with it at this point. You know what I mean? It's kind of, it, it sucks to say, but it, uh, most of the disparities and problems we have, the small things we have to do in order to stay alive are sort of baked into us. So when people so, show sympathy, um, the first thing I tell people is if somebody says that they're sympathetic towards you and they want to give you money, have a business ready for investment. Don't, hey, give me $20, give me, have a business proposition to say, okay, well, if you want to help, the backbone of any strong community is small business. So in the black community, if we can build small businesses with investment, nobody's asking for, like I said, nobody wants your charity. Um, even if you have a 501c3, donating to good causes is cool, but if we can build our businesses based off the investment from people who usually don't invest in our uh, in our community, that is better off to me. Um, but that will, again, as black people, we work hard. We're going to get what we get uh, anyway. But yeah, that sending $10, I thought that was the craziest thing ever. I, I have, <laughs> my brother said he had a coworker he hadn't talked to in years, uh, call him. And she was basically like crying on the phone. I'm so sorry. All this stuff is happening to black people. And he was like, I don't even really know you, but okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but <laughs> it's just another Tuesday. You know what I mean? Like we, we've learned to live with it. And the media has 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 taken it you know to another to another route and i think the black lives matter protests as they're going on people start to get this this empathy for our community which is fine i understand that but you know going about it when people ask so what can i do i always tell them the same thing it's just like just be yourself like you don't even have to if you're not racist or if you're not doing anything to black people just be yourself you don't have to <laughs> do anything else <laughs> just, just be yourself and and it'll work out fine stop being weird i, I say that a lot to people when they like, just stop being weird man just don't be a dick and uh, you should be all right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I can't really, you know, give everybody solutions, but if there had to be one investment in small businesses is there, um, you know, using Bitcoin uh, as a different currency as well to give us leverage. Um, I think, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that, that point, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from Molly, but yes, anybody watching, if you feel sorry for people, go another route. Don't, don't do the whole $10 demo, especially not to me. I'm good. <laughs> I didn't know that was even a thing until I started talking to some of my friends from Silicon Valley and they're like, oh, you got to text your black friends and let them know that you got their back. I'm like, that's just seems seems strange. It's like, I, again, it's well-meaning, but it's like, yeah. it's like the other day I was looking, Denzel's my favorite actor. I was looking for a Denzel movie, couldn't find it anywhere. You know why? It's in the black section. Why yeah. you got to put Denzel <laughs> in the black section? Like, I don't want to go to the black good. section. He makes He's good movies. Black. And especially if you listen to him talk about it, I don't think he wants to be in the black section. I think he wants to be in the great mm -hmm. actor section. The guy's one of the greatest actors we ever had. But somebody absolutely. meant well by that, so I don't fault him. But I think mm -hmm. it's counterproductive sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. I definitely see that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like you said, people mean well, but going about it is a whole nother story. And I, all my friends that were white, none of them text me or called me uh, during this time period because we're real friends. They don't need to <laughs> remind me. It's like, they don't need to remind me. Hey, buddy, you know, I've never, it's like, what? That, that's never going to happen. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you there. Awesome. Uh, well, you're doing great work, man. This is good stuff. I, I definitely it. recommend everybody read your book. And you, and so tell us about the second version that's coming out. Oh yeah. So the second edition, Bitcoin in Black America, seven new chapters, uh, over almost 200 uh, people in the directory. Um, as well as, uh, you know, topics such as uh, Bitcoin and uh, marriage, talking about Bitcoin and, um, and reparations. Uh, we get deeper into the banking system, discuss concepts like uh, the Cantillian effect, uh, S2F model, things that basically uh, if Bitcoin in Black America was a 100 level college course, this is a 200 level. It's taking it up a notch. Nice. It's describing more of the foundational things of Bitcoin, keeping everybody together. And of course, in the Black community, um, one of the things, the last book, it was a very small international chapter. Uh, this one is expanded uh, massively over uh, 60 countries that I discussed, uh, mostly Black and Brown countries. But because of remittances and how communities are building, wanted to make sure that's in there as well. So that announcement will come uh, before the end of the month and uh, excited to have it out because uh, it's one of the only books uh, where I introduce scarcity. Um, some people, you know, they have books that, you know, sell forever. 
for the hardcover version, I'm only selling 10,000 ever. So um, sort of introducing scarcity like Bitcoin, uh, where if you want to get it, you have to get it now. And, uh, and buying the book now, it could actually cost, you know, could make some money off of it later in the future if you want to sell it to somebody else. So just introducing scarcity uh, just sort of as an idea. And then also there's an educational, uh, three educational webinars attached to it. So if you buy it, you get access to these webinars, get to meet people, uh, CEOs of different companies, do demos on some of the products discussed in the book. So you basically have a live demo of what's in the book, which for most people, I don't think they've seen that before. So a lot of, a lot of cool stuff with this second edition. I uh, have some partnerships uh, with eToro um, and uh, with Edge Wallet. So uh, glad to be bringing it forward and uh, hope everybody gets a chance to read it. Awesome. You already have one um, purchaser, um, the user that posted earlier um, at nice. CJ the Smart Guy says he'll be ordering your second book. So nice. Oh, nice. yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we we're a little over. Maybe we have time for one more question. If you have anything, Bruce, otherwise I have something I can ask. Go ahead. OK, so um, this is coming from Bitcoin Backholder again. How did you get involved in Bitcoin in the very beginning? And what was it like going to those early meetups where you were the only black person there, as you were saying at the beginning of the call? Oh yeah, so in 2013, um, it was, Bitcoin was perceived as for criminals, it was for drug dealers, it was for scammers, it was the old Mount Gox, uh, Silk Road days. So uh, getting into Bitcoin, I had to find good sources. And luckily, the first person I heard about it from was Max Kaiser, as far as video. Uh, who was a reliable source. He's still around to this day. Um, Max Kaiser and then the Winklevoss twins. I saw an article where they were talking about Bitcoin's price maybe a hundred thousand one day, which like if you see in the book, the money is what attracted me, but everything else is what kept me. The technology, the history, the community, everything uh, that goes along with it is what kept me around. So that's how I got started. And, um, you know, one of the things that I want people to remember is I thought I was too late in 2013. Like, I thought I was like, man, this is already past $100. I'm, you know, people have been buying it at $1. I've, I've missed the boat. So anybody watching, no matter when you start, you want to feel like you're late or like you've missed something. Uh, it's only been 11 years since Bitcoin's been out. So uh, you have plenty of time uh, for a new monetary system to progress, plenty of time going forward. So that's how I got started. And uh, yeah, hopefully anybody who gets started uh, uh, at this time doesn't feel discouraged and can push forward. Bitcoin is, like I said, it's going to be here for, for a while. Awesome. All right. Well, I guess well, this is great stuff. Yeah. Thanks again. <laughs> this, is, this is super fun. Uh, definitely people watching, buy the book and order the new book. And uh, can you tell us what your Twitter is so people can follow you or any anything else like that uh, people can find you? I love your Twitter, by the way. I think you've had a lot of great insights on, you know, all these topics, Black Lives Matter. You've made some interesting uh, tweets and other other uh, topics around Bitcoin for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, Twitter is uh, at Bitcoin Zay, Z-A-Y. Um, and that's mostly where you can find me uh, if you want to contact me, DM, send anything. Um, and if you happen to be on Instagram, Bitcoin Zay LLC, um, not really big on pictures. Uh, I'm more of a writer, so <laughs> I'm more on Twitter than Instagram. But yes, Twitter is good. And uh, yes, got some interesting, interesting tweets coming, um, you know, with this new book coming as well. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And Bruce, what about you? Where, where can people find you? Me? I'm on Twitter too. Bruce Fenton is probably the easiest way. Oh yeah, Bruce, my brother. <laughs> and right. you can find us at CoinMarketCap. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Thanks again so much for having just what a great conversation. And this hopefully we'll have you guys back right. on in the future. Yeah, right, remember? Good to see you, Isaiah. Good to see you, Molly. Bye, guys. Have a good one. Have a good one.